Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord tonight in his house on a Wednesday night. Amen. When it's dreary outside, it's always happy inside. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we worship him tonight. Lord, in your name, we ask that you would bless, that you would work, that you would touch, that you would move, Lord. God, we ask that you would anoint us, Lord God. Help us to open our hearts and our minds to hear and receive your word tonight, God. And help us to apply it to our lives, Lord. Help us to leave here different than we came today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. Greetings in Jesus' name. Everyone that is here in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. And everyone that is joining us virtual on Facebook. Amen. We welcome you. Amen. In Jesus' name. Tonight I'm going to do a little bit of teaching in lieu of preaching. Um, I'm going to share with us some concepts of the Word of God that I think will be a tremendous blessing and a help to each and every one of us. I'll say us because how many of you have ever heard the phrase, what's good for the goose is good for the gander? Amen. Ever heard that? Amen. Whenever I preach, what I'm preaching is applicable to me as well. Amen. All admonished preachers to practice what they preach, to live what they preach, he says, because, he said, God forbid you become a castaway, if I can paraphrase it. Amen. He said, you can preach it, but if you don't live it yourself, you too can become a castaway. That's right. Amen. So what I'm going to teach and share with us from the Word of God tonight is applicable to everybody. Turn to your neighbor and say, that means you. That means you. Amen. Amen. Go with me in the Word of the Lord to Psalm chapter number 34. The book of Psalm, chapter number 34. Amen. And we're going to start reading at verse number 8. If you're there, say amen. Amen. The Bible says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How many knows that the Lord is good? Amen. Blessed. Who wants to be blessed here tonight? Amen. Who wants to be blessed tomorrow? Amen. And next week, and next month, and next Amen. year? Amen. Well, here's, here's how we're blessed. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Now, in this single verse of scripture right here, that's a very powerful statement. Because what I want to share with us from the word of God tonight is going to potentially and possibly challenge our thinking and challenge our faith. Because sometimes it's easy to talk about trusting God. That's right. But it's a different thing to trust Him in the doing. That's right. Amen. In the action. In the choice. And what I'm going to share with us tonight, we're talking about the blessing of the Lord and tasting to see that it's good. And it says, blessed is a man that trusteth in Him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye His saints. For there is no want, somebody say, no want, no want, to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Let's pray. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for one more opportunity to gather together in your name here in the house of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your abundant blessings, for your daily provisions. We thank you that for your mercy and for your grace. You Lord, we ask you, Lord, to move in this service, Lord. Anoint the teaching of your word. Anoint me, Lord. Ask you to minister to every heart and every life, Lord, that is in this place. Those joining us remotely, I'm asking you to strengthen and encourage God. I'm asking you to impart revelation and understanding, Lord. And I'm asking you to confirm your word, Lord, in our hearts and in our lives. We give you all the praise and the glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, and you can be seated. What I'm going to teach us tonight, in case you didn't know, I'm one of these weird preachers that I, I actually love teaching more than I do preaching. Now, uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of uh, apostolic preachers prefer preaching to teaching because it's uh, a lot of times, and I'm it's kind of bad to say it this way, but a lot of times there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of energy. That's because the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. And so when someone is preaching, uh, especially if they're preaching about faith in God and they're preaching about miracles and healing and things like that, and the spirit starts moving, people start responding to that. And there's a lot more energy. There's a lot more uh uh, stuff going on, but teaching to some, unfortunately, comes across as dry as a saltine cracker. But I love teaching. Amen. I was one of these weird kids. 
uh, early in my childhood, uh, it was not by choice. It was kind of forced upon me. My, my mother drugged me to church every year for our annual church convention that was held around the 4th of July week. And uh, we had a daytime Bible teacher. And there were a couple over my childhood, but we had one, uh, one gentleman there. He was, he was as old as Methuselah, if I remember correctly. And not to be any disrespect, but that to me as a young kid, that's what it seemed like. All I remember of, of him was that uh, his name was Elder Hughes. And uh, he, you've seen those uh, commercials and stuff where you have the teacher that's like, Okay, class, today we're going to talk about super glue. Please pull out your bottles now. That's the way, as a kid, it seemed to me. And as a result, a lot of young people my age, they ducked out of the daytime class. They went over across the street, started playing basketball and stuff. But my mom would not let me do that. I had to stay put. And they had the air conditioner running at negative 18 degrees, and, and everyone was in there covered in blankets, and so... The cold air was keeping me bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And over time, God began to use these biblical teaching sessions to develop a love and an appreciation for the taught Word of God. And I believe that I actually benefited by sitting in those sessions all those years where a lot of other people ducked and hide and went and found other things to do. And so I love teaching. And tonight I'm going to do some teaching that I believe is going to be a blessing. I know it will. If we will put it in application, I know that it will be a blessing and a tremendous help. Now, we talked in these three verses of Scripture that we read. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, beyond the shout, beyond just feeling the presence of God, beyond just talking in tongues and, and, and getting exuberant with all of that and dancing and running the aisles and, and uh, you know, just getting a, a blessing in that capacity. There is there's so much more to God That's right. than just feeling the glory bumps. There's right. so much more to God than just feeling the presence of God that brings some tears to your eyes and, and causes you to, to feel good and get excited. There's That's so much right. more that if you will start diving into the goodness of God. How many knows that God is good? Amen. God is not bad. God is good. And the Bible gives us an open invitation to taste and see. Now, God's goodness, think of it this way, is like a banquet table. And it's all prepared. It's all decked out and laid out. And the invitation is, come try some. Come try some of God's goodness. Come and taste it. You'll see it's good. You'll see that God is good. And so there's an open invitation. And, when, and as I dive into this topic, and I want you to understand, most people approach this subject. I haven't announced my title, but I'm going to in just a second. A lot of people approach this topic one of two ways. A very, uh, some people will approach it very authoritarian-like and saying, well, it's, it's, it's either do or pay the consequences. It's like a running joke I have with my friend over at Grace Chapel Pentecostal Church in Duncan. Brother Andrew Benton, I told him, I said, one of these days, I was joking, of course, I said, one of these days I'm going to get up at General Conference and preach a message called Turn or Burn, and he just thought that was hilarious, and, uh, but some people approach this specific, this specific uh, topic in that way, they say, you either do it or else, you know, uh, but we're talking about the goodness of God, Amen. and I don't think that when you start talking about the goodness of God that you want to start talking about consequences and punishment and stuff like that. I, I believe that there's a better way to approach this, and that is my goal here tonight. And so he says, blessed is the man that trusteth in him. So first and foremost, we understand that in order to taste and, and uh, be able to be a partaker of the goodness of God, first of all, we have to trust him. That's right. That's right. We have to trust him. Now, if we do not trust God, we are going to be hesitant to come and do what he asks to taste and see that he always comes through. 
and that he's always good and that he's always faithful and that he never lets us down and that he never fails us. Trust is a big thing. That's right. Trust is a big thing. How many of you have ever trusted somebody and uh, they let you down and they disappointed you? God will never do that. But we as human beings, we have uh, had people betray our trust. We have had people disappoint us. And so we struggle with this concept of absolute trust. But in order to be a partaker of the goodness of God, we have to learn to trust him. Okay. Now, whenever you start learning how to drive a car, are you automatically, the very first time, an expert driver? No. Most of the time, your parent or whoever is teaching you how to drive is sitting in the passenger seat praying for the rapture of the church because you're still learning how to apply and remove proper pressure to the brakes and the, and the gas pedal. And it's like, <laughs> and uh, you're getting car sick and turning green in the face. And uh, it, takes some, it takes a little while for you to work your way through all of that. And part of the reason you go through all of that is the person learning how to drive is afraid. They're afraid of the vehicle that they're driving. They're afraid of getting on the road. They're afraid of other cars on the road. They're afraid of tractors and trailers buzzing by them. And so when you're learning how to drive, a lot of times you start off like maybe in a parking lot where you can drive around in circles and you can, uh, you know, uh, practice without hitting anybody or anything like that. And then after you feel more comfortable, in other words, after you've developed some trust in your level of learning, then you move out onto the road. And maybe you try uh, a stretch of road that's maybe not as crowded or busy and, and you, you gradually progress into where you're hitting I-44 at 70 miles an hour and you're not worried about it. Right? right? Trust yeah. is a learned behavior. That's right. That's right. And so the subject that I'm going to talk about here tonight, this, this, this concept of trusting God in this capacity, let me tell you something. The only way to trust him is, is, is through uh, being put in, put in the situation where you have no other choice. That's right. That's right. But I can tell you up front that God is always faithful. Amen. Amen. Tonight I want to talk to us on this thought, living in the overflow. Living in the overflow. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. He says, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The Bible tells us here in verse number 9, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. There is no one to them that fear him. The word fear is used twice in that sentence. And while they have the same root word, they have slightly different meanings and applications. So the first word that is transliterated as fear here comes from, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. And this word fear is an adjective. How many of you know what an adjective does? From English class. What's an adjective do? It describes a noun, doesn't it? Yeah. An adjective is a descriptor. It kind of describes the nature or the characteristics of a noun. And so it says fear the Lord. It sounds here like that's going to be a verb, but this is actually, in this particular instance, according to Strong's, this is an adjective, and it is a descriptor. And so uh, it comes from the word yare, which means to be morally, to be morally reverent, respectful, and God-fearing. So this descriptor, this adjective, is saying People that are morally reverent, respectful, and God-fearing, we are his saints. 
Now look at this. The second usage, the transliterated word of fear, also comes from the root word yare. But in this particular time, it is not an adjective, but it is, in fact, a verb. And it means... <clears throat> it means... I lost my place. To be in awe, honor, and to have respect. And so while they are similar, while they are related, you've got to understand that, that there's, there's a slight differentiating. So here's the thing. You can say, I have faith in God, but do you trust him? That's right. You can say, I believe in God, but do you trust him? That's right. It's like saying, I believe that Jesus died on the cross, but have you obeyed the gospel? Paul says, not all have obeyed the gospel. That's right. We have a lot of self-pronounced Christians around the world. They say, I believe that Jesus died and rose again. And he died on the cross and paid the price for the sins of the whole world. I believe that with my whole heart and I accept that into my heart. And Paul says, that's great that you believe. But have you obeyed the gospel? That's right. The Bible tells us, James tells us, faith without works is dead, being alone. He says, you cannot show me, if I can paraphrase for the sake of time, he says, you cannot show or demonstrate to me your faith without works. That's right. He says, but I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, he says, believing must be accompanied by action. That's right. You can say, I'm a Christian, and that's supposed to be an adjective. That's supposed to be a descriptor of who you are. That's saying that you are a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ. But does our lifestyle choices mirror up with that proclamation? Are we doing the things that Jesus said was required to follow him? He says, if any man follow me, he must take up his cross daily and follow me, he must deny himself, right? So are we denying ourselves? Or are we just living for self? Are we taking up our cross daily? Or are we just thinking about Jesus every once in a while? And so faith and action have to accompany one another. That's right, that's right. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. There was no want to them that fear him. The word want here was transliterated from a word called makyao, which means need, poverty, lack, or deficiency. So when we put all of this together, we can determine that those who reverent, those who reverence, respect, honor, and stand in awe of God are assured. Somebody say, I know. I know. That they will not, they will not suffer lack deficiency or poverty that's a powerful statement right there isn't it amen so when we put all this together those who reverence respect honor and stand in awe of god are assured that they will not suffer lack deficiency or poverty now immediately on that statement many people are saying hang on hang on back up put it in reverse because i know plenty of poor christians I know plenty of Christians that live paycheck to paycheck and they're barely scraping by and they don't have a penny to their name. I know plenty of Christians like that. And so how can you say that they're not going to suffer lack or deficiency or poverty? Let me tell you something. When we do things God's way, Amen. we're going to live in the overflow. That's right. Now, I'm not here to pull a Joel Holstein on you. Y'all know it that I boldly and publicly call him a false prophet. Because that's what he is. Amen. God never in his word says, I want you to be too blessed to be stressed. And nowhere in his word does he say, I'm going to enlarge your bank account and make you a millionaire and because I want you to have the nicest and the finest. He, he doesn't say that. That's right. Amen. But there is an overflow of the blessings of God that God wants us to live in. And anybody can live there. Amen. Amen. Anybody. It doesn't matter your ethnicity, your skin color, your gender. It doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what you do for a living. Anybody, from a janitor to a school teacher to a CEO of a corporation, 
Anybody can live in the overflow of the blessings of God. That's right. Anybody. Now, those who reverence and respect, honor, and stand in all of God are assured, guaranteed, promised, made certain that they will not suffer lack, deficiency, or poverty. So how do all this correlate? We're going to dig into it, and I'm going to show you. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9 through 10 says, Honor the Lord with what? Thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So, Going back to what I said here, where he says, fear the Lord, ye his saints, there is no one to them that fear him. And uh, that's all talking about those who reverence, respect, and honor God are assured that they're not going to suffer lack, deficiency, or poverty. Amen. Proverbs was written by Solomon. God gave Solomon wisdom that surpassed anybody before him and anyone after him. And Solomon penned these words with God-given wisdom. And he said, honor. We were told to honor, right? If we don't want to suffer lack. That's right. Honor the Lord with your substance. And with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So here we find a key. Here we find a key of how to get into the overflow of the blessings of God. You've got to honor God with what you already have. That's right. You have to honor God with the wages you're already making. I heard a preacher say it like this one time. He said, if you're making a minimum wage at McDonald's, and that's not where you want to be for the rest of your life, make sure you're paying your tithes and giving in the offerings. Because if you're wanting to make it to the next level and you're wanting to make it to the next level after that, you got to learn how to honor the Lord so he can promote you through the ranks That's and right. take you to a higher level. That's Amen. Right. He says, but if you're stingy with minimum wage, God knows you're going to be stingy with $60,000 a year. That's right. That's right. And so the concept of living in the blessings of God and living in the overflow is that we have to honor the Lord with what we've already got. That's right. I grew up on a farm way back in the sticks in West Virginia. We, we had a 80 acre farm and uh, when I was a kid and uh, my mom and dad were younger and, and, and more agile, we had several gardens. We had at least three corn gardens. We had at least two or three potato patches. We had a garden right behind the house that had a mixed variety of things. We, we had all kinds of gardens. And uh, we had corn coming out of our ears. And my dad, when we would harvest the stuff out of the garden, you know what my dad did? He looked at this verse of scripture. He's, and he said, I want us to live in the overflow. And he said, the Bible says to honor the Lord with your substance and... With the first fruits, somebody say first. First. Of all, not some, all thy increase. My dad paid tithes off of corn and potatoes and tomatoes and the stuff we grew in the garden. We would gather all this stuff, bundle it up, drive it to Pastor Lewis's house, and dad would give it to him. He said, This is the first fruits of my harvest. And God bless me. Because that's what the Bible says to do. Some people think, well, that's crazy. Why would you do that? Because the Bible says to. That's right. The people that think that that's absurd and that that's crazy, and that's why they're living paycheck to paycheck. And they're right. always broke and they don't have a dime to their name because they're holding on to their substance. They're holding on to what they've got. And they're not willing to honor God with it. But the first key to trusting God Everyone still with me? Amen. The first key is to honor the Lord with your substance Amen. and with the first fruits of that increase. And he says, if you'll do that, your barns 
shall be filled with plenty. See, some people think, oh man, if I made $500 this week and I paid 10% tithe off of that, that's $50 right off the top. That only leaves me $450 and I've got all these bills that pay. I've got all these ways to stretch it out and I'm not sure that that's going to be enough. I'm here to tell you, God is not a man that he should lie. Right. Amen. His word is forever settled. He gave us a promise. Somebody say, he gave me a promise. He, he said, if you will honor me with your substance and the first fruits. The first fruits is not just uh, you know, crops and vegetation and stuff like that. It's your wages from your job, what you earn, Amen. you know, uh, whenever you bring home that paycheck or you get that direct deposit, the very first thing we're supposed to do is honor the God and, and through trust and obedience. And so if we will do that, Jesus said, I'll make sure your barns are filled with plenty. Now, we don't have any barns here in law. But in other words, what he's saying is, I'm going to make sure there's food in your refrigerator. I'm going to make sure that there's food on your shelves. I'm going to make sure that there's gas in your vehicle tank. I'm going to make sure uh, that, that you have it, what you need to live and then some, because you're going to be living in the overflow. Amen. He doesn't promise to make us rich, but he does promise to provide everything that we need and then some, Amen. because it's an overflow. It's the blessings of God. But not just anybody gets to live there. It's those that trust him. And I'm here to tell you tonight, paying your tithes requires trust. Amen. That's right. Absolutely. It requires trust. Amen. And so Jesus tells us here, God tells us, honor the Lord with thy substance. And with the first fruits of all that increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. See, our concept is, well, if I give this in the offering, and if I pay my tithes, and if I give offerings, which are two totally different things, then, then I'm going to be shortchanged, and I'm not sure that what, what I have left is going to be enough. God says it's going to be enough. Amen. That's right. God says it's going to be enough. He says that you're going to have plenty. That's right. That's right. That's what he says, isn't it? The New Living Translation of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he, somebody says he, he. will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. You see, when we honor God by faith and we give to him of our finances in our increase, then by honoring God in this way, he promises that we will live in an overflow. That's right. Amen. How many people like to struggle? How many people like to worry about whether or not you're going to be able to pay that light bill? You know, we just passed Black Friday last week, and some people are about to experience Black Friday this week because they can't pay their light bill. And next week might be Black Friday too. Until they can pay that light bill. But, you know, God doesn't expect his saints to be poor and destitute. That's right. He Amen. doesn't expect us to go from week to week not want, not, not knowing what we're going to eat, not knowing how we're going to make it. Uh, in, in other words, Jesus tells us this. He says, give no thought for tomorrow. If I can paraphrase it, he says, Tomorrow is going to take care of itself. Hey, but he tells us, he says, I feed the birds. And he says, the lilies of the field, they're, they're, they're arrayed with beauty that, that, that compares to nothing else. He says, they don't do anything. He says, I just take care of them. And he says, right. don't you trust me enough to believe and know in your heart, I'm going to take care of you too. He says, you are much more valuable than many sparrows. That's right. And he says, if we will seek first the kingdom of God Amen. and his righteousness, all these things, what all things? things? What things? Making sure the light bill's paid. Amen. Making sure there's gas in the vehicle. Making sure there's food in the fridge. Making sure that the kids have clothes and shoes on their feet. Making sure that all your bills and obligations are paid. And then you're going to have some left over because That's it's right. an overflow. He says, if you'll put God first, 
You're going to live in a place that not everybody gets to live. Amen. But anybody can live there if they want to trust him. That's right. Many years ago, I read about uh, the the, uh, the guy that was, uh, I, I don't know if he was the owner or CEO or something, J.C., uh, not J.C. Penney's, it used to be uh, Sears and Roebuck, way back there. The guy did not go to church. He believed in God, but he did not go to church. But what he did was he had enough trust in God. He did believe that if he would tithe, now this is the this, I mean this is the high up guy here, Sears and Roebuck, right? This is before online uh, purchasing was a thing. Everyone had to go to a brick and mortar store. This is a guy, you know, mega millionaire. He says, if I will tithe off of my gross income, and I will give it to God. I know without a shadow of a doubt my business will be blessed. And guess what? He was right. It works for anybody. That's right. You don't have to have the Holy Ghost to live in the overflow. Oh, did I say that out loud? Right. You do not have to be baptized in Jesus' name to live in the overflow. Come on. You don't have to believe that Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. To live in the overflow. That's right. He says you've got to trust him. Amen. And honor him with your wealth and your first fruits of all your increase. If you will do that, the promise is that he will fill your barns, he will fill your vats, and there's going to be an overflow of the blessings of God. Amen. The open invitation is come and taste. For yourself, Amen. experience it. See how good God is. Amen. Amen. Both the sinner and the saint can participate in the goodness of God. Amen. It's capacity. I'm here to tell you, tithing is one of the best things a person could ever do. Paying their tithes, it unlocks the blessings of God. It opens doors for you that no man can shut. It opens doors for you. It opens favor for you with God. Because what you're telling God is, God, I trust you. Mm -hmm. God, I trust you. Amen. Yeah. Out on Fort Seal, I'm, I'm now a budget analyst, but I used to be a, uh, a resource manager. And so uh, when we understand that when God gives us a job and he blesses us with a good income, and we're, we're, we're bringing home a paycheck or a direct deposit or whatever. We are resource managers. Mm -hmm. It's not really ours. God's wanting to see how much we trust him. And if we're going to honor him first. That's right. Let me tell you, some people don't understand this about God, but, but, but in his capacity, some people say, well, man, he's selfish. He's greedy. You know, uh, uh, God gives the first and great commandment. That supersedes anything and everything else. He says, Love the Lord thy God with all. That's right. That's right. Amen. All your mind, heart, soul, and strength. All. He requires us to be fully devoted and committed to Him and to love Him with our all. And then He says, Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, a greedy person, they can't live in the overflow. Amen. Right. A selfish person, they can't live in the overflow. That's right. Someone who doesn't trust God, they can't live in the overflow. That's right. You can't pass by somebody in need and they're homeless and they ain't got nothing to eat, no clothes to wear, and uh, you know they got two little kids and it's nine, nine degrees outside. They got nowhere to go. You can't just pass by them on your way uh, uh, to the store so that you can splurge and blow your money and buy some extra Christmas presents on yourself. And not even bad an eye thinking, I need to stop and show a little bit of compassion. Jesus says, love him with your all and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. We've got to be open and compassionate to others around That's us. Right. These are keys to living in the overflow. That's we right. are resource managers. That's Amen. Right. Or you can think of it this way. We're funnels. You know, every 3,000 miles, 5,000 miles on certain vehicles... But every 3,000 miles on your vehicle, you're supposed to get an oil change. That's right. And they put a funnel up there after they remove the cap, and they're putting the 
oil in there, right? And so we are funnels. God blesses us. He's good to us. And it's supposed to flow through us and meet a greater need. That's right. Amen. You see, the car ain't going anywhere until the oil gets inside. That's right. We are funnels. We are resource managers. We are blessed by God so that we can honor Him and bless others. That's right. God doesn't expect you to give your entire paycheck away to strangers and all of that. Of course not. God wants you to live in the overflow. That's right. That's but the right. concept of the overflow is that it's more than enough. God gives us enough to meet all of our needs. But the overflow, you see, the overflow is to see how much we're going to trust him while we give to our neighbor. Right. And we give to the hurting and the needs around That's us. And right. we bless those who are less fortunate than us. Amen. Yes. Amen. Don't forget the, the, uh, uh, the tree down at the mall. What's it called? The angel tree. It's a Walmart this year. Angel tree. Some kids, their, their, their requests are usually very basic. I would love some socks, some pairs of underwear, a pair of pants, coat. Every once in a while, they'll throw a toy in there, but their needs are basic. And we're worried about getting a PS5. We're worried about getting the latest and the greatest and the next upgrade. When there's some people thinking, I wish I just had a pair of socks. Talk about that. That's right. That's what the overflow is for. Amen. God blesses us so we can bless other people. Amen. Right. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 38 says, give and it shall. It doesn't say it might. Does it? It says it shall. Give and it shall be given unto you. Amen. Now, Jesus said that. That's what he said. Joel Olstein didn't say that. Pastor Grimm didn't say that. Jesus said that. Come on. He I said, if you will give, it's going to come back to you. Right. Amen. Good measure. Don't cheat your neighbor. Come on. Don't cheat the need. When you see a need, do your best, do your ability to meet that need. Come on. Amen. You see somebody that has a legitimate need and you toss them a quarter, but you got $500 in your wallet, shame on you. Come on. Good measure. According to your ability, the overflow. If God's given us more than enough and we don't need all of that, that's just extra, meet the need. Amen. Help. Love your neighbor as yourself. Press down, shaking together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Look at this concept. Jesus says if you will give, he will use men to give back to you. That's right. How many times we've heard testimonies about people sending in a, a, a love offering or, or, or they, they pay their tithes because they said, I don't know how I'm going to pay my a mortgage bill this month if I do this, but I just know that God's word says that I'm supposed to do this and I'm just doing it by faith because I'm not going to rob God. And they write their tithes check and then they're sitting down counting out their bills and they're like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And they go to the mailbox and all of a sudden there's a letter and someone sends them a thousand dollar check. It's anonymous. How many times have you heard that testimony? That's happened to us. Right. Only I didn't find it in the mailbox. I've had people walk up and slide nine $100 bills in my hand. Another time, it was six $100 bills. I'm here to tell you, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's right. Live in the overflow. That's right. God wants us to live there. Amen. He does. He wants us to live there. All of our needs met and us having a little extra so that we can help alleviate and meet the needs of other people around us. Amen. Given shall be given unto you. So look at this. It, Jesus promises if we give, he will make sure to use others to give back to us, and we shall experience the overflow. That does not mean that we will all be rich. That's right. Here's where me and Olstein differ. He says, God wants you to have that BMW. I don't find that in Scripture. Come on. I don't find that in Scripture. God wants you to have that four-story house. I, I don't find that in Scripture. God wants you to have that $2,000 suit. I don't find that in Scripture. Come on. 
I do find things like Paul talking about embroidering your hair and looking flashy and, 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 and how we're supposed to be modest mm -hmm. in apparel. Come on. And I believe that applies to men and women. That's right. Amen. Yeah, I, I know some church guys that they, they're, they're like peacocks. They want to stand out, wow. be the center of attention as soon as they walk in the room. And, and, and their shoes and their clothes and, and, and their watch and everything about them draws attention to them. Come on, now that ain't apostolic. Amen. We're supposed to be modest. On, We're right. supposed to be humble. We're not supposed to put a stumbling block before our brother. That's we right. walk in strutting around like a proud peacock saying, oh, look at what God's blessed me with. And someone over there is sitting there wondering how they're just going to feed their kids after That's church. Right. That's right. Come on. That's We're supposed right. to live in the overflow and lift up our eyes on the field looking at the needs around us and using that overflow to help meet those needs. That's right. That's right. That is the will of God. And so, God doesn't promise us that we're going to be rich, but his church here on earth is absolutely dependent on the financial support of those in the body of Christ to pay their tithes and give according to their ability in the offering. Someone say, that means me. That means me. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 7. Every man, according as he purposeth, in his heart. See, God lets you choose. God lets you decide. God lets you select the option of how much you're going to give, not on your tithes, that's a set amount, that's 10%, but your offerings that are separate, they are above and beyond tithes. God lets you choose whatever you purpose in your heart. He says, let him give. But make sure it's not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. That's right. That's right. Don't give because the preacher pressured you to give. Don't give because you feel like other people are going to look down their nose at you because you didn't give. Give according to what you purpose in your heart because you know that God loves a cheerful giver. Giver, Amen. you're supposed to live in the overflow when you say, I've got more than enough. God, God's blessed me. All of my bills are paid. All my needs are met. You know what? I, I don't have to give it all away, but there's an overflow of the blessings of God in my life. I can help meet some other needs Amen. of other people around me. Amen? Amen? God loves a cheerful giver. Now, we're going to go to the dreaded scripture that everyone wants to put people in hell over, and we're going to approach this from a very nice angle. All right? Malachi chapter number 3 and verse number 8. Will a man rob God? How many of you got the backbone? How many of you got the courage? How many of you have got the boldness to walk up to Jesus and point a nine millimeter to his face and say, stick him up and give me everything that you got? Of course not. Nobody's that foolish. Nobody's that stupid. But the Bible says, will a man rob God? Yet, everybody say yet. Yet. You have robbed me. God says, man, he has been stuck up. Some people have robbed him of his possessions. And then he says, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In other words, God, how is that possible? How did we rob you, the creator of heaven and earth and the whole universe? How did little old me rob you? How is that possible? And he answers the question in tithes. And offerings. Mm -hmm. See, people rob God all the time. And they do it by withholding their tithes and not giving any offerings. That's right. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Now, verse number 9, he goes on and he says, you are cursed with a curse. How many people want to be cursed? Mm -hmm. Man, I don't want God to curse me. Let me tell you something. God's curse carries a lot of weight. Right. Hmm. I don't want to be cursed, but he says, you are cursed with a curse. Who was cursed? Those that robbed God in tithes and offerings. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you ever you ever notice that if, if you don't pay your tithes and you don't give any offering, have you ever noticed how often you get a flat tire on your vehicle? Or how many times the check engine light comes on your vehicle and the car won't start and it keeps breaking down and you have to keep taking it back to the shop repeatedly for the same issue that the mechanic said he fixed and you just can't get it fixed. And even if you get that situation resolved and all of a sudden there's a health crisis and somebody has to go to the hospital and there's like a $15,000 medical bill that you got to pay. Let me tell you something. God's going to get his tithes. That's right. That's right. It's better to pay them. Then be cursed. That's right. Because God will curse our finances. That's why some people can never get ahead. That's why some people never have a penny to their name. That's why some people scrape by and they never have anything. And they, 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 they can never move forward. It's always moving 10 steps backwards. It's because they're cursed by God. That's right. For not paying their tithes and not giving any offerings. That's right. I didn't say that. God said that. He says, you have robbed me, even this whole nation. But he gives us a solution in verse number 10. Look at this. If, 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 you're, if you're cursed, you don't have to stay there. Because it is the will of God for you to live in the overflow. You can have God uncurse your finances. You can have God uncurse your circumstance. Oh, yes, you can. Look, verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That there may be meat in my house and prove me. Somebody say, prove him. Prove him. Amen. Now, herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room to receive it. And, verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine catch the fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Host and all nations shall call you blessed. It is the will of God for us to live in the overflow. God desires to bless us. God desires to provide for our every need. God desires for us to live in the overflow, not just so that our needs are met, but because we're funnels and we're resource managers. He wants to see how much we trust him, and he wants to see if he can trust us to take the overflow and alleviate the needs of other people around us. But some people don't do that. That's right. That's right. The first taste of money, and they say, I'm not going to pay my tithes. That's an outdated Old Testament tradition, and you can't prove to me in the New Testament that that's still valid and still in effect, and preachers are all greedy. Preachers are just after your money. I'm not paying my tithes. Preachers are all hypocrites, and Christians are all hypocrites. Yeah, I hear that all the time. All the time. They're in denial, and they're not living in the overflow. And the thing is, they can't live in the overflow. And so these people take on additional shifts. They'll take on overtime, sometimes multiple jobs, because they're trying to experience what life is like in the overflow. But all they would really have to do is bring their tithes into the storehouse. And let God uncurse their finances and their financial position and bless their family finances and budget and situation. Now that's the word of God, isn't it? Amen. Amen. I want to be blessed and not cursed. Amen. Amen. And see, so he said, he says, prove me. He says, try me. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He said, if you're skeptical, if you doubt, it's okay. We're learning how to drive. We'll start here in the Walmart parking lot after hours when there's no cars. And you're not going to hit anything. And there's not going to be any major accidents. I, I, trust me a little bit. Trust me a little bit. And then when you trust me a little bit, see if you can trust me a little bit more. And a little bit more. And the next thing you know, you're on I-44, going 70 miles an hour, going the speed limit. And, and there's no fear because you just know that God's going to provide every one of your right. needs. It is the will of God for every Holy Ghost field apostolic Christian to pay their tithes and to give cheerfully in the offerings. Not because I need your money, not because God needs your money, but because he wants us to live in the overflow. Amen. There's people on the outside of this building that are just desperate for us to live in the overflow because they're hoping someone will come by with a pair of boots 
on a cold winter day or maybe a new coat. Maybe take them to McDonald's and give them a hot meal and put it in their belly. Uh, maybe the first time they've eaten in three or four days. They're looking for somebody to be, show compassion to their situation. That's the purpose of the overflow. Amen. That's right. Amen. 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 A tithe is 10%. It's a set percentage. It's a set amount. And we're not going to get into all of that. You can read about Abraham. You can read about Melchizedek in the book of Genesis. But a tithe is 10%. A tithe is not an offering. And an offering is not a tithe. God said here in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, he says that he's been robbed by people withholding their tithes and also their offerings. It's not just the tithe he's looking for. He's looking for the cheerful givers. That's right, amen. Because the church is a nonprofit organization. How else is the light bill going to get paid? Yeah, that's right. How else is the, the, uh, the, the heat and air and the water bill and, and the, the rent payment? And, and how else are you going to uh, expand? How else are you going to remodel into a nursery? How else are you going to be able to send kids to youth camp? How else are you going to do that unless people cheerfully give? Because the pastor sure ain't made of money. Amen. Amen. That's right. It, God designed this thing in such a way that the congregation, uh, to give you a little bit of a quick, 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 quick history, God set up out of the 12 tribes of Israel, he chose the Levites, which was where the priests and the ministry came from. And they were the only one when they went into the land of promise that God did not give them an inheritance. Everyone else got designated portions of land and property and cities and territories, but the Levites got nothing. He scattered them throughout all the 12 tribes to be ministers and to serve uh, in the things of God to the people of God. And the tithes and the offerings that the people were supposed to bring the tithe fed the priests, That's and right. the offerings sustained the church. Amen. The offering was the upkeep of the church, and the tithe was what fed the preacher. That's, right. That's a biblical concept that God established early in the Word of God. Paul tells us that the laborer is worthy of his hire. That's right. And, and he begins to talk about, he says, don't muzzle the ox that treads down the corn. So what is he saying? He says, tithing is to support the ministry and offering is to sustain the church. How else can you do things unless people cheerfully give? That's right. Amen. It just can't happen. That's right. You know, in most cases, the church cannot apply for and receive a federal grant. Uh, during this COVID-19 uh, epidemic, there was a special exception this past spring and and they allowed you to fill out paperwork and to see if you could qualify to get a, a small pot of money. But on most situations, uh, churches are not like other businesses because we are a nonprofit organization. We can't just fill out paperwork and send it to Uncle Sam and say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that you can send me $20,000 because they're not going to do it. That's right. We are supposed to be a self-sustaining entity. And the only way that's possible is when people give. Yeah. That's right. Amen. Now, he says, if we pay our tithes and we give any offerings, he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, and there will not be enough room to receive it. Again, that doesn't mean that God promises to make us rich, but he promises that we will not suffer lack, need, poverty, destitution, or want. But rather, he promises he will ensure all of our needs are met, and he will even give us extra on top of that. I'm hurrying. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 22. I just said that God doesn't say he's going to make us rich. And this verse of scripture may seem confusing, but stick with me for the next five minutes because I'm going to dissect this for you and make it more clear. Proverbs 10 and 22. The blessing, someone say the blessing, the blessing. of the Lord, of the Lord. it, this is the blessing, maketh rich. And he addeth no sorrow, no sorrow with it. With it. 
Some people want to be rich, and so when they get paid on Friday, they run to the casino. They run to the Comanche Nation casino, and they burn through that, that, that paycheck. And they've never even made it home to pay the mortgage or the rent or any of the bills. They just blow it on cigarettes and liquor and gambling. And then most of the time, they go home and they're empty-handed. That's right. They may win $200, but it costs them $2,000 to get that $200. That's right. And people get addicted to that pursuit of riches. And so what does it do? It brings sorrow. You go That's home right. and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, honey. I don't know how we're going to pay our mortgage this month because, uh, you know, I blew our money. I blew our income at the casino. <laughs> and then he's in the doghouse for the next six months because he's an idiot. But people do it all the time. I'm surrounded by them at work. They just love to give the Comanche Nation Casino their earnings. That's right. It's like, here's my paycheck. Let me just sign it over to you. There's a lot of sorrow with that kind of pursuit of riches. Right. If you want to be blessed and live in the overflow and have no sorrow attached to it, pay your tithes and give any offerings. That's right. Amen. And God says, Watch what I'll do. Amen. He says, I'll open the windows of heaven and I will pour, not sprinkle, pour out blessings upon you and you won't be able to contain it. That, again, that does not mean he's going to put a million dollars in your checking account. But you will have enough and then some. That's right. Amen. 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 Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches. In glory by Christ Jesus. Put simply, it's like this. When we don't have what we need, Jesus already has it. And he promises to enrich us or cause us to accumulate that, that which we do not yet have if we will, by trusting him and obedience to his word, pay our tithes and give cheerfully in the offerings. Some people think that they can't afford to pay tithes or give any offerings, but quite frankly, a person can't afford not to. That's right. Unless you want to live paycheck to paycheck, penniless, never having nothing, always scraping to get by. But if you want to live in the overflow, pay your tithes and give any offerings because God wants us to live there. God wants to bless us in that capacity. Amen? Amen. That's why there are Christians, going back to my thought a few minutes ago, and whenever I said a lot of people are thinking, well, I know plenty of poor Christians that don't have a penny to their name. It's because a lot of times they're not living in the overflow. People don't trust God enough to pay their tithes. People don't trust God enough to, to give cheerfully in the offering. Now, you say, how much am I supposed to give? The Bible says, according to your ability and whatever you purpose in your heart, in relation to offering, not tithes. Tithes is 10%. And so Jesus condemned the Pharisees because, uh, you know, Jesus was watching the people coming and putting in the offering. And all these people were coming and putting in large sums of money and being braggadocious about it. And there was this old widow woman. She came and cast in a mite. And Jesus turned and told his disciples she put in more than all of them because she put in everything that she had. She trusted God that much. She says, this might is all I've got, but I trust God to provide every one of my needs. And she Amen. put it in the offering. I'm here to tell you, that's the kind of trust God Amen. is that's looking right. for. That's right. That's right. He's wanting to know, can you trust him with your paycheck? Amen. Can you trust him with your family's budget? Can you trust him to make sure that your bills are paid, your family is fed, all your needs are met, and to make sure that there's some extra uh, leftover living in this overflow. Do you trust God that much? Amen. If so, he says, come and taste and see how good I am. Live in the overflow. Pay your tithes. Give the offerings and watch what I'll do in your life. Amen. That's right. Amen. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Amen. So what we don't have, he already has it. He says, pay your tithes, give your offerings, and then I'll share with you my riches. I'll make sure that all your needs are supplied. And then some on top of that. So if you need it, God has it, and he's willing to impart it to you. And the way to receive his overflow blessing is to pay your tithes and to give in the offerings. 
And for your faith and obedience, he will give it back to you, and then so. Now look at this. How many of you have ever heard of fiat money? F-I-A-T. Fiat, fiat. Fiat money. I learned something new today as I was reading this because I was unaware. How many of you know that the American dollar is no longer backed by gold? And hasn't been for a very long time. I was unaware of that. I took two, three economics class in Cameron University. I love economics, and I'm still, I was still unaware of this. The American dollar is not backed by gold. You know what it's backed by? The word of the federal government. <laughs> That's not very. It's true. good. Trust me. This is worth something. This is valuable. Yeah, you can spend this. That's not good. Fiat money is the government issued currency that is not backed by physical commodities such as gold or silver, but rather by the federal government that issued it. Fiat money is a government issued currency that uh, it, it has no support and backing. Fiat money gives central banks greater control over the economy because they control how much money is printed. Most modern paper currencies, such as the U.S. dollar, are fiat currencies. One danger of fiat money is that governments will print too much of it, resulting in hyperinflation, because fiat money is not linked to physical reserves of gold or silver. It risks losing its value to inflation or becoming worthless in the event of hyperinflation. If people lose faith in the nation's currency, the money will no longer hold any value. Earlier in U.S. history, the currency was backed by gold and, in some cases, even silver. The federal government stopped allowing citizens to exchange currency for government gold with the passage of the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. The gold standard, which backed the U.S. currency with federal gold, ended completely in 1971, six years before I was even hatched when the U.S. government also stopped issuing gold foreign governments in exchange for U.S. currency. Since that time, U.S. dollars are now known to be backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. It's called legal tender for all debts, public and private, but not redeemable in lawful money at the United States Treasury or any Federal Reserve Bank. U.S. dollars are now legal tender rather than lawful money. We can, we, and so to summarize all of that, our dollars are worthless. American dollars is worth only the word of the federal government. That's right. Isn't that disappointing? Yes. Extremely. Now, God makes gold. That's right. In fact, the streets of heaven are paved with it. If you read the book of Revelation, it tells you the streets are paved with pure gold. As a matter of fact, he's got more than gold. He built the walls of New Jerusalem with jasper. The gates of the city are made of pearl. It's decorated in goodly and precious and valuable, priceless God makes this stuff. He don't mean nothing to him. It's a rock. God makes gold. And we print paper. That's right. And so if you want to have some backing to your revenue, to your income, if you want God to say, I'm not here going to leave it, uh, you know, for you to take the government at their word, I can back you with my gold if you'll pay your tithes and give any offering. I will make sure that every dollar you spend has the full support and the weight of heaven behind it. Amen. And I promise you I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you so much that you can't contain. You'll have an overflow, and that way you can bless others also. Amen. And that's the kind of living I want to experience. Amen. Amen. He says, prove me. So when we open here in Psalm chapter 34, he says we got to trust him. 
people struggle to trust God in this specific area quite frequently. They don't pay their tithes because they look at their budget. You know, a responsible person sits down and they write all of their bills and, and, and when they're due and, and the amount due and they write their total revenue and they, they say I get paid on this such and such time of the month and the bills, these bills are due on such and such month and, and when I reconcile the, the difference between the income and the bit outgoing bills, here's what's left. You know, a responsible person builds a budget. That's right. So you need to have a budget as you guys grow older. Amen. If you don't, and, and if you are older and you don't do that, you probably need to do that. Because God has called us to be wise Good and faithful. What? Stewards. What's a steward? It's a resource manager. Amen. We say it's not mine, it's God's. God gave it to me to meet all of my needs and then take the overflow and bless others also. And so who are the others? It's not just taking care of the homeless and those in need in your, in your own community. It's not just buying stuff, socks and underwear for the kids on the angel tree. But it's investing in Missions America. Like this church right here with the Adopt the City program. It's sending money to, for, to help support our foreign missionaries. I got a piece of mail yesterday that came. And uh, Brother Matthew Ball, he's our World Missions Director. He sent out a thing. He said, hey, I'm asking all churches to prayerfully look at your budgets and see if you can do so. And if you can, I would like you to cut a check and mail this right back to me as soon as possible by December the 10th. We want to try to get some money out to our foreign missionaries so that they too can have a Christmas because most of them were in third world countries. That's right. That's right. And he said, even if their kid just got one little box of something simple, candy, something, he said, do you realize how much that would mean to them? That's the purpose of the overflow. That's right. That's the purpose of the overflow. And the more we trust God, the more God can trust us. And the more that we give, the more that he blesses, and then we can continue giving at a greater capacity and a greater level. Some churches in our organization, they give uh, in, in single services. And this isn't special people come to this, their congregations. This is their home church congregation. I, I read frequently uh, in the Apostolic Witness <clears throat> that they'll take up a special offering and some churches, it's, it's, it's like a God thing. They just take up $20,000 in a single service. Boom. Pass the plates and pray. And they just they say, I trust God because I know it's coming back to me. Amen. And they take that and they disseminate it to needs. A lot of times, people that raise stuff like that, they send it here. And that's what helps us pay our rent payment each month. That's right. that's right. If we didn't have people living in the overflow, taking a little bit of that overflow and blessing Great Plains Apostolic Church, like Bishop Green at, at, at First Pentecostal Church up in Yukon, if, if he didn't take part of his overflow and bless us, we could not pay our rent. That's right. We could not keep the lights on. We could not meet our financial obligations. And they're not many. They're really not many. Our total obligations are about $800 a month. That's the rent and all the utilities and everything combined. But if we didn't have people living in the overflow, we couldn't do that. Amen. That's right. We're not self-sustaining yet because we're dependent on people giving from the outside so that we can take care of what's going on on the inside. It is the will of God for every church congregation to become self-sustaining so that we can become the giver instead of just always being the receiver. That's right. Amen. That's right. And the way to do that is for people to trust God and pay your tithes and give your offerings. Amen. I don't preach on this much. I don't talk about this much. Matter of fact, I believe this is the first time in three years I've even taught on this subject. But I'm teaching us this biblical principle today because I want to empower you to live in the overflow. Amen. I want to empower you to experience the blessings of God. Taste and see how good God can be to you. Amen. This, is, this goes beyond just today and next year, this goes on into uh, you know your adulthood and starting your own families and other places. You know, if you will learn the biblical principle of paying your tithes every time you get paid, if it's direct deposit or if it's a hard copy check, ten percent belongs to Jesus. That's right. Put it in the plate. Say, Pastor, here's my tithes. 
put it in the church bank account, and you know what that'll do? That'll go a long way to making sure not just that our current bills are made, but we shove it over into the savings. And so when we're ready to remodel the nursery, we've got some resources in there to remodel the nursery and get it ready for the babies. And when we're ready to send kids to youth camp, then we got money in the bank to go to youth camp. But it can only happen when people give their tithes and according to their bills, they give them the offerings. That's right. And that's the Bible, isn't it? Amen. That's what the Word of God has to say. God wants us to live in the overflow. I want to be blessed. How about you? Amen. Why don't we stand all across this place? Amen. We're going to dismiss with prayer here tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings upon our lives. I pray, God, that your word that has gone forth from this pulpit today, God, that you would find a place in our hearts and our lives, God, that, that you would help us, Lord, to come to a place, Lord, where by faith we trust you. When we begin to look at the, the numbers on our, on our papers and, and on our budgets, God, and we say, I don't have enough, let us have the trust in you to say, God, if I will honor you according to your word, you will make sure that I have not only enough, but there will be some left over. Help us, God, to put your word in action by faith and to trust you, God. Help us to adopt this biblical principle of tithing and giving in the offerings so that we may live in the overflow, God, and experience the goodness of God at a greater level that we may be givers and not just receivers. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name, and we will see you Sunday at 10 o'clock.